A lot of people feel that copy is one of the first things you do. Writing your copy, sitting down and writing your copy is the first thing you do when you try to sell a price. It's not the first one. It's the last thing you do. That's where, that's, that's where, the, sell, that's where the sell begins. But you can't sell somebody effectively unless you understand the person, understand the, what are their fears, what are their wants, where, where, what are they coming from? So the research is really where you need to start. And welcome to The Robust Marketer. Today, I am super lucky to have Drew Eric Whitman on the podcast. For over 33 years, advertising consultant, trainer, and author Drew Eric Whitman, aka Dr. Direct, has been studying the psychology behind response. He has consulted with some of the world's biggest uh, entities, corporations, individuals, as well as a lot of affiliates on really how to get uh, your your message out properly, the benefits of your products out properly with your copywriting skills. He's been involved in Affiliate World conferences from almost the beginning uh, and has provided our audience with a tremendous amount of value. Uh, he also has contributed to our Acceleration Module course uh, with iStack Training where he produced a three-part series on copywriting for affiliates that's getting some great feedback from our customers and students. So. Welcome to The Robust Marketer, Drew. How you doing? Thank you very much, Eric. I am absolutely honored to be here. Thanks so much. Appreciate the opportunity. Nice. Yeah, we had a few false starts trying to get this going, but everything appears to be working nicely today. <laughs> the communication gods are looking down favorably upon us now. Hopefully this lasts for the duration of the podcast. Exactly. So most of our audience is going to be familiar with you and your work, especially cash advertising. But just give us a little overview of your marketer's hero's journey. What, what brought you to where you are today? Well, um, so, some of the some of the uh, viewers may know the story. Basically, I, I started probably long before most people started in their industries. I was in fifth grade. I was 11 years old. Um, I designed a catalog sheet of jokes and gags. I used my dad's 19, went into his office, used a circa 1940s royal typewriter with a nylon ribbon. That's before carbon ribbons. That's before daisy wheels and the spinning balls and the IBM Selectric typewriters. That's way before word processing, of course. That's where, you, that's where if you had wanted to center something on a line, you had to count the number of spaces in your headline, for example, oh boy. and back up 50% of those spaces to start typing in order to center it on the page. It was ridiculous. That's one step above typesetting. That, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, block that's, printing. That's fine. Exactly. So, um, so I used to take a, um, uh, I was into jokes and gags and crazy things like that, you know, fake broken arms and fake bullet hole decals you put on glass, all the crazy things that fifth graders are, are interested in, you know, whoopee cushions and, and the like. Oh, yeah. And I designed a catalog sheet. And what I did is I wrote the copy. I used my dad's typewriter to make lines, moving the carriage across, sticking the pen or pencil into the hole and moving the carriage and then rotating it vertically. It's unbelievable what he had to go through back then. Um, and um, basically wrote the copy for jokes and gags. I had about 20 of them on a sheet. And actually that's a slide that I show in one of my presentations, the original one. And I used to write the copy. I, I wasn't much of an illustrator. So I used to paste up illustrations from catalogs that I had. And I put an order form in the side and I used to go to the printer with my dad and used to make photocopies to this and then hand them out in school and collect orders. And that's, that got me into, into selling. And from that point on, I mean, that was a little bit after having a first lemonade stand. But uh, after that, I fell in love with, um, with writing and advertising. So I started reading as many books as I could read and understand on the subject at that time. Uh, eventually I, uh, um, went to and graduated from Temple University with a degree in advertising. Started working for ad agencies, uh, publishing companies, uh, direct insurance, uh, direct to the consumer insurance companies. And um, wanted to do more than that. Wanted to just, I wanted to sit, do more than just sit behind somebody's desk. I always enjoyed teaching. So uh, what I did was I decided to start writing articles. And really my journey started um, uh, as far as broadcasting what I knew to the world uh, by writing articles. And I did that for what were called inner circle mail order publications. These were newspapers um, all circulated. Of course, this is pre-internet. 
Um, and I used to write articles and uh, I developed a uh, persona. I did that back in, in the 90s, early 90s, actually gave my first uh, seminar back in 1993 to a chamber of commerce in Pennsylvania. Got great uh, response from it. It was a subject I was passionate about, loved it, always interested in psychology. You know, how can you use words? How can you craft words that actually make people want to give you money? You know, when I was a kid, I was getting having people give me money from the simple words that I wrote on a little catalog sheet with crude illustrations. I mean, you know, um, obvious corrections done with correction film and erasing, you know, crazy rudimentary things like that. So that I, I got more and more interested in teaching. Uh, so um, uh, ultimately, after giving seminars uh, around the country in the United States, um, I decided to write a book. And the interesting thing about cash advertising is, and I explained this to someone who I did a consult a private consultation with um, at, uh, at the conference in uh, Berlin, was I wrote the manuscript for cash advertising. And then what most people don't know is for one reason, okay, I took all the pages, I printed them out. Okay, now we're now now we have laser printers. Okay, so yeah. okay, step up a number of years here. Yeah, um, so I actually took all the pages, I put them in a ring binder, I punched holes in them, stuck them in a ring binder, just to see them in in, uh, in hard copy, and for some reason, got busy with other things. Um, my wife and I were in the middle of a cross country move. I put them in a binder and I put the manuscript in my garage. And for there, it sat for years and years and years. Just sat there. And one day, I was looking through my garage, and I saw the manuscript. I said, "You know what? I, 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 I like. Uh, there's there's some good information here that I think would be helpful to people. I think I want to try to get this thing published." And that's what I did. I, I, I decided to go ahead and um, and one of the hardest things to do is to find a literary agent. That's like the needle in the haystack. If you try to get um, self publishing is one thing, but if you try to get your book out in bookstores worldwide and get professional worldwide distribution it takes quite a bit of effort you need a literary agent yeah so ultimately um um found an agent very interested shopped it around there were a few publishers that were interested and we um we just chose uh, career press and um and as i say the, the rest is history and from that book i'll tell you that book um made a big impact on a lot of people in a lot of different industries and that's the most I get, I get emails all the time from people all over the world. And I'll tell you what, there's nothing more satisfying than having spent a lot of time and effort to create a product and having good feedback from people who really appreciate what you're doing. I really appreciate the time and effort you put into it. And um, they say writing is the easiest thing in the world. You just go into a room and you cut your wrist and you bleed all over the page. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, you sweat over if, if, if you have um, a, a, um, a sense of doing things right and having a, a standard of quality, you sweat over every single word. And the editing process is brutal. I mean, it got to a point where I couldn't even read my own writing anymore. You know, you're going over constantly. But eventually, uh, it received great um, 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 acceptance in the marketplace. And... Um, here I am today, and right now I'm focusing primarily on con consulting and speaking. Um, and then a few years later, I, I wrote uh, Brain Scripts for Sales Success, and that was sort of like the consumer principles that I discuss in uh, cash advertising, but applied to one-on-one -on -one sales, direct sales, okay. uh, with scripts that can be adopted for most any product. So that's that's basically a journey. I mean, I really started as a kid. Um, if, I don't know, Eric, if you're familiar with you probably are, I'm sure, uh, Earl Nightingale, you know, he was consider the dean yep. of personal the, the dean of personal development um his uh, a, a, a very well-known audio presentation of his is called lead the field and another word is called uh the strangest secret and uh, he said there are two types of people there are goal people and there are river people he says the goal people are those that come up with something that they're interested in um they develop an interest and then they set goals to achieve those interests. And after they achieve those uh, achieve those goals, and after they achieve the goals, they set another goal. And um, after they after they set that goal and they've attained it, they start looking for what else do I need? What else should I do to keep myself interested? That's the goal. That's the goal person. Mm -hmm. And they talks about river people. It says and river people are the people who almost from birth uh, have an interest in a topic that no matter what else comes up, that's always what they're interested in. 
And even if they didn't have to do it, you know, you know, the old question, what would you do with your life if you didn't need the money? Mm -hmm. you know, and that would really help you settle on what, re what you really love to do if you didn't need to do it for money. And teaching advertising really something is really bad for me. I'm a river person when it comes to advertising. I love words. I've always loved psychology and I love teaching and helping people. So that's that's my journey. That's that's how I got to be at this point here. Very interesting. I, you were talking about some of the feedback you get, uh, and I just I just sort of retweeted or reposted something that, that you put on your Facebook page the other day about someone making a comment on Amazon about this about cash advertising this book that sells for actually I'm not sure exactly how much it sells for, but it was worth more than his fifty three thousand dollar college education that he received. <laughs> that he got more value out of your book. That's got to feel great. That does feel great. That, that feels that feels amazing. I don't feel good. I, I feel bad for the for the his, his professors in college. Yeah. <laughs> don't feel bad for professors. The academy needs some evolution. I think is is one thing yeah. that we're we're seeing That's in, uh, well, in know, on the training I've team always, right now. I've always been, I've always I'm sorry. I've always been a, a a seminar junkie and a learning junkie, an audio learning junkie, and um, one thing that's always irked me is going to see a seminar where the speaker is very interesting. I mean, very interesting, but you leave and then you have no information that you could actually put to use. Mm. I mean, the guy was fascinating, but now what do I do? Exactly. And conversely, you have the speakers that are super entertaining or are super knowledgeable, that is, but you're falling asleep halfway through the training. So I said, if, you know, if I'm going to commit myself to teaching. It has to be a combination of, there has to be a balance of entertainment and practical knowledge. So when someone leaves, they say two things. Wow, that was really fun, enjoyable, entertaining. And wow, I've learned a lot. Yeah. Now I know, now I know what to do. You have to have content and entertainment. That's, you know, it's, to be successful in this business. And from every bit of feedback I've heard and seen it personally, you know, the audience is usually pretty enraptured with, with what you're doing. You've got your persona, the doctor direct, you've got your white coat that, that sort of aids, you know, lends to the theatricality of everything. And, uh, and yeah, the, the reviews are glowing uh, on, on your, your talks as well as the, the, the module that you created for, for iStack training for the acceleration modules. Um, very, very cool. So. Cash advertising, I'm, I just had a specific question about cash advertising. It's become, I, I hear it referenced all the time. Any thread on STM, for instance, where someone's talking about like the most important books in the industry, uh, cash advertising gets mentioned. It's, I hear the word Bible thrown around uh, around about it quite a bit. Um, so anyone out there, if you haven't read cash advertising, go grab a copy of it and, uh, and, and take it in. It's uh, it's a really really great piece. When did you know that it was going to be the hit that it's become? Was it something that came out of the gate really fast, or was it something that just built over time? Um, that's a real, that's that's a good question. I re started receiving feedback on it very quickly, um, and the feedback was coming from um, um, checking Amazon reviews. I mean, that's you know that's that's a great place to see a mass number of a mass amount of feedback quickly and also emails from people who picked it up in the most unlikely places. I got an email from someone who picked it up in a, in a, um, on a train station in China, you know, who would think, right. And, um, just from all over the country, I guess, I guess it was more of a slow, slow buildup process. I mean, I, I started getting, um, quick positive feedback. Um, but it is kind of like a snowball effect, I'd say, you know, yeah. um, because it's, it's, you know, it's the word of mouth thing. Basically you could advertise as much as, uh, as you want and you are your own best spokesperson. However, when someone hears it coming from you, well, of course it's going to be good. Of course the person's going to say good thing. It's his book, yeah. right? Um, but when the snowball effect, oh, well, I heard about someone say about this book from this, blog. Oh, in this forum, I heard someone talk about. So eventually it's this critical mass that gets reached. I think it's probably the same way for most books. That's very, yeah, that, that does make sense. I've never written one myself, so I don't know, but I'm hoping that our, some of the courses that we put out have, have a similar effect, especially yeah, once we're able to, to split them off and, and, and do some really cool stuff on demand that we're working on now. So you made this acceleration module for us. I reached out uh, after having seen you in, in uh, probably in, I forget if it was Asia or Europe, uh, last year, probably Europe, yep, and uh, and asked you to be a part of our of our upcoming course. 
uh, and then and set you know set you the task of creating a sort of three part module, uh, a little course on, on copywriting. What what did you approach? What sort of mindset did you approach that task with? Well, you just Eric, you just gave me the perfect segue. You talk about mindset. Well, uh, initially, I had to stop and think. Okay, so I have three 30 minute segments. How do I construct this so that after each 30 minute segment, the viewer actually leaves with something that they can apply, either change of thinking or actual pragmatic suggestions that they could use and adopt the next day. Um, and the, um, the confines of a 30 minute um, uh, limitation on each, and that's, and that's basically we were, we were shooting for about 30 minutes, um, was challenging because it had to be enough to be impactful, um, but also um, uh, concentrate on those things that would make the greatest difference. Now, advertising, as you know, is a pretty broad subject. I mean, there's books out there that are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages, and there's so many different uh, approaches and angles and uh, and um, categories of information that you could talk about positioning, you could talk about design, you could talk about copy, you could talk about psychology, you could talk about so many different ways to, to approach each of these. Uh, so to do it in 30 minutes was was challenging. But I think the most important thing was to start out with, and this is why the first module is about the mindset. You have to change your mindset about advertising. Um, you know, in Berlin last year, I gave a, um, I gave a talk uh, that talked about the mindset, the change um, that's required in order to start making positive changes to your advertising. Because unless you have the right mindset, everything, you, you, everything else you're going to, that you're going to do is going to be influenced by, by that mindset. So that's why the first module is about how to think differently about your advertising, how to change what you're, the way you're, because think about it, the results you're currently getting from your advertising are the, is the product of the words that you've selected to put in the ads, obviously. And the words that you select are the result of the mindset you have about constructing advertising. So unless you have a, a mindset that leads to the creation of successful advertising, you're going to end up with something that's going to be less than ideal. So that's why the first module is about how to think about it, how to, uh, how to approach the whole idea about influence. A lot of people, they're, here's their mindset, Eric. A lot of business people, affiliates or business people in, in any industry, their mindset is talk about my products don't disparage the competition. Don't be too forceful or try to sell too strongly. And pretty much try to stay within the confines of every, what everyone else is doing. You don't want to stand out quite too much. Now, it sounds ridiculous. And you may think, well, you know, why would someone want to do that? Well, take a look at it. Look at the majority of advertising that's being done online and offline. You know, um, Look at look at landing page after landing page. Open a newspaper. Open a magazine. Watch commercials on TV. They almost are all the same. They all follow the same a same a very similar mold. Everyone, all, almost all business people, they're kind of tippy toeing with their advertising. They're afraid to push push too much. They're afraid to offend. They're afraid to stand out too much. Which is crazy as that is. I mean, in advertising, you have to stand out now. Your, your goal is not obviously not to offend. You don't want to offend people. But if you keep yourself so reserved and held back, instead of being here, you're going to start like down here. So this is where you're starting. You don't, want to, you don't want to offend too many people. So this is about the level of where your advertising is going to be, where if you push it a little bit further, then you start standing out from the crowd. You got to be a little louder. I always I like to say in the seminars, you know, business people are afraid to whisper when they should actually be shouting. You know, so so it's that it's that mindset you have to have that it's OK to be more aggressive. I'd rather see a business person and I've talked to business owners in consultations and say, look, I'd rather you push it past where your comfort is and see the results you get. And then if you have to, OK, tone it down a little bit if you have to. But first, see what it's like if you go past your comfort level. Yeah. For example, in the in Berlin, uh, this past uh, conference. I showed that one 
and, and people have mentioned it afterwards because it's so striking. Um, do you remember the, um, the one graphic that I showed on the screen for the security cameras? And so many security cameras, and this is all online advertising, uh, ads and websites for security cameras are the typical thing. You know, they show a happy family. They say, you know, uh, protect your house for, and they give a price. And it's just, it's just the same old blah. It doesn't stand out. There's no impact. It doesn't show. Remember, rule number one is to get attention. You have to, nothing else will matter after that. The attention has to be grabbed first. So in this ad that I showed, it showed a series of mug shots. And the most, do you remember that? The most yep. stomach churning looking mug shots you can imagine. <laughs> and and the chick on the end was given two middle fingers, as you recall. Yeah. You know? And um, you saw, you know, the guy, the guy has uh, every possible strange um, facial, um, 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 you say not not just piercing, but some strange uh, surgery done to make themselves look bizarre and you know, body shot, mods, and, yeah, 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 body mod. Thank you. I couldn't think of that. Body modifications. I mean, bizarre looking thing. And with the headline, um, "Who's creeping around your house at night?" And you see this with the image, and it's like, whoa! And it forces you to read it. Just push a little bit stronger. So that's the idea of changing your mindset. Push a little hard. Look at what everyone else is doing. Don't do what everyone else is doing unless you know they're incredibly successful. Do it's, something. Set your own path. You don't have to do what everyone else is doing. Think, what could I do that will jolt somebody out of their out of their daily hypno, hypnotic trance? Because most people go through their daily routines in a hypnotic trance. It's not the kind of hypnotic trance like they're walking like this, obviously. But it's, they're in their own routines. They're so in their heads. You know, Richard Bandler said, um, um, he, he said, you need to get people out of their trances and into yours. Mm. Richard Bandler, New Orleans, Richard, NLP. And uh, that's very true. You need to shake them up just for just for a second to get them to to take note. Yeah. To take yeah. notice. That's, that's and, super uh, interesting. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so to, to answer that, that's why I went with, uh, with, in, with um, changing the mindset as the first, as the first uh, module in the course. And secondly, headlines, because, what do you need to do first? You need to grab their attention. Do that with headlines. And the third module was body copy. And that's where, and that's, that, that, that was a challenge to get into 30 minutes. So yeah, I, I thought I could have done, I could have done more justice with much more times, just so much to get in 30. But, um, but uh, so that would be the, nat that's the natural progression really. And um, so probably that answered your question. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> you want to Around influencing, you know, I had a, we had a great talk um, at, at Facebook Mastery Live. We recently did this event, and uh, one of our speakers really got into the psychology into get. And I think he's, I know he's read Cash Advertising personally. Actually, he's a friend of mine, and he's talked about the book. Um, but he 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 did a, a you know some some tips on really not you know when you first get to an ad, your instinct is to like you say just write about it. You know, you write at, at one level what you think about it. And it's almost like you're thinking, yeah, you're sort of thinking about things on a surface level. What he really advocated was like, you know, if you're if you're writing about something that you don't know a lot about, go have a coffee with someone who is passionate about the thing you're writing about and, and really tease out, you know, the not, you know, both the positive benefits and the potential repercussions uh, of, of not taking a product like that. Seriously, the, the example he used was was golf. Uh, it was golf clubs and he got to the underlying psychology of golfers that not only did they want to win for their own personal game, they don't want to look like dummies and they don't want to lose to their friends on, on a Friday afternoon. They really don't want to be the short, they don't want to be the one that owes drinks at the end of one of these rounds. And so really focusing on the, not only your personal relationship to golf, but your interpersonal relationship with those that you golf with. Uh, and sort of really digging into that mindset, which is something that I know that, that you advocate when it comes to um, for instance, the Life Force Eight, which you mentioned uh, in the course, is that that's that's obviously something that, that you want to focus on when you're writing. Oh yeah, I mean the, the most important. See, a lot of people feel that copy is one of the first things you do. Writing your copy, sitting down and writing your copy, is the first thing you do when you try to sell a price. Not the first one. It's the last thing you do. That's where that's that's where the sell that's where the sell begins. But you can't sell somebody effectively. Unless you understand the person, understand the, what are their fears, what are their wants, where, where, what are they coming from? So the research is really where you need to start. I'm not saying you have to spend uh, months and months and years researching a particular um, uh, product um, and 
like let's say you're working in an ad agency, for example, ad agency. You don't have, you don't have the time. You're going to have multiple multiple clients. You can't spend you know weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and months. You have one client coming one day, another client coming. You may be writing about three, four uh, different products on, on on one day, and here comes another client, and there's a new client. I mean, it's impossible. You need to just be able to um, understand the basics of what drives someone. Why does someone buy the product? What's the main motivation? Um, so that's something you need to understand first. Um, you need to know what's most important to them. Now you mentioned, you know, sitting down with somebody. If you can actually talk to your audience, I mean, that's the horse's mouth right there. Exactly. You know, um, if you're approaching, especially a market that you've never, you've never been to before, it's going to make, you're going to make great strides and even learning a few of the buzzwords from the industry. You know, if you're writing about, let's say you, um, you're trying to sell um, a coffee product to get really pragmatic here. You know, you're an affiliate for a coffee product and you've been a tea drinker your whole life. You've never really gotten into coffee. But you think, OK, here's a great affiliate program. They're going to pay me, you know, a substantial amount for each sale. And they're providing me with all these um, marketing tools. But you don't really. And let's say you wanted to. OK, sure, you could use all their marketing tools and never create anything new on your own. But let's say you wanted to go a little bit further. You want to create your own landing page. You want to create a whole website and really blow it out, okay? Um, or maybe you, were, you wanted to be an affiliate for multiple coffee products. So you really want to blow, you want to become the coffee king, okay, on the internet, okay? So you're going to have to learn about, the. you're going to not, not, not necessarily about the industry, and it depends on what level you want to get into it, but you have to learn about, a little bit about what makes these people choose one over another, what makes these people want to spend their hard-earned money on coffee that may be $50 a pound rather than something that's $8.50 a pound. You know, so there's some terminology you want to be able to throw out there um, so they understand, hey, this person knows exactly what I'm talking about. Um, uh, so copy is really the last part of the equation. Uh, you don't want to write about something you don't understand about. And if you can, through your words, have cause someone to say, yeah, this guy gets it. This guy gets how I feel when I lay in bed at night, knowing I don't have a, a, a security system on my house. I hear a little scratching at the door at night. You know, did you ever hear a little thump and you're not sure whether to go downstairs and turn on the lights or just close your eyes because you're really tired. Yeah. You Depends know? how close your bat is under your bed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, should I should I get something that I could actually use to protect myself and my family? Should I go back to sleep thinking someone could right now be walking up the steps and about ready to open my five year old son's bedroom door? You know what I mean? So yeah. you know, you, yeah. I mean, you could really powerful. Drive. Yeah, I mean, the stuff's visual, but the the reason you feel the emotion of of, of that is because you could somehow relate to it. Yeah. Now, if, now, if you now, if I'm speaking directly to parents and I'm a parent, wow, I could really relate to that. I mean, I'm a parent. I have two sons myself and I could relate to feeling like that. So I could talk out of that kind of experience. How about if you don't have smoke alarms in your house or a fire extinguisher, for example? Um, not that long ago, I purchased um, um, an escape ladder yep. for my for the second story of my house. I, I did. I went on Amazon and I got that. What drove me to do that? What drove me to get fire? Now I have fire, I have hardwire fire, um, uh, you know, and carbon monoxide smoke alarms throughout the house, but I did not have fire extinguishers. Okay. Now uh, recently I started thinking about this because one of we had a we had a false alarm in the house and it made me think about it. So I thought to myself, wow, what happens if I am sleeping one night? And how about the headline, Eric? You may have heard this. I did in one of the presentations. Will your family die in the night? I mean, that's, that's pretty impactful. Yeah, that, that's impactful. That's, that's scary stuff. So if you know what drives somebody, yeah. you, could, you could get into the emotion, not just the reasoning, you know, not just the statistics, not just the numbers. That's the cold, calculated left brain side. The reptilian of making, brain. Uh, yeah, yeah. Of, making, of making the decision feel good to me as an adult that I'm spending money. Okay, 
So I could make it. So emotionally, I'm driven to buy this escape ladder, the fire, um, uh, the, the extinguishers, a fire blanket to throw over something on the stove that might explode and turn into a fire in the house. I'm driven by and I'm driven to buy this stuff because of emotions. Now I look at the price of these things, Eric, right? I see the price. Okay, the fire extinguisher is going to cost me this much. The fire blanket is going to cost me this much. The escape ladder is going to cost these, this, me this much. So I'm rationalizing it. But wow, do I have this press of this emotional side? My kids, you know, my wife, the whole, the whole house up in flames and smoke. What happens? God forbid. If I'm negligent, I don't spend this little bit of money. Maybe it's a lot of money. But I don't spend it. And now I'm looking back a year later by myself because of my wife and my kids. I don't want to say it. Yeah. You know, it's that emotionally impactful. Yeah. So that's, that's understanding your audience. So you, you talk a lot about uh, in, the, in the acceleration module about benefits, benefits-based copywriting. And, you know, the example that we just talked about was more on the consequences side. I'm wondering in your work and when you, when you work with different brands, is there, there, are there different times to use uh, one or the other? Do you find that a combination of both works better? Do you lean? It's sort of like the light side and the dark side of the force. Uh, you know, you need both maybe to be, to be fully effective. But what are, where do you fall on that? Well, are you talking about um, which of the like the life force appeals are you talking about? Well, just I'm actually I'm just talking about specifically versus benefits negative. versus consequences. You know, the consequences of your family of losing your family if you don't invest in a in a smoke alarm. That's obviously going to be the one of the most impactful things you can possibly do. Is there? Do you have a rule of thumb for when to yeah. really focus on benefits yeah. versus consequences, or oh, how to use them in tandem? Yeah, yeah, I'll use them both. You know why? Because because people are motivated different ways. Some people are motivated toward things. You know, they're motivated to get things, and other people are motivated to avoid things. So you know, now now if I'm if I'm you know we're talking one on one, and I'm trying to sell you, I can maybe through our conversations flesh out your buying strategy. We'll say okay, your convincer strategy. We'll call it. You know, I can see where you are and and hearing your language, hearing how you talk, and maybe throwing a few test questions at you and whatnot. But when you're writing copy and you don't have the, the advantage of the feedback, the live feedback, you got to throw everything at them. You know, you got to throw out the positive stuff because you might be one of the people that are drawn toward getting positive benefits. You got to throw out some of the negative stuff because you may be one of the people who are repelled by negative things. You know, if I leave out one or the other, I may alienate you or just not convince you and, and push you in the direction I want to go. So uh, I really try to throw the kitchen sink at you. And it really, Eric, goes back to the old long versus short copy. You know, good long copy will help pull good short copies because it's the salesperson who could throw all the, all the entire sales pitch, who could give you the entire demonstration, who can call some former prospects who could put all the materials in your hand, who could put the equipment into your hand and have you actually vacuum the rug and see how much more dirt gets pulled out. So if I'm there longer and I'm a good salesperson, good copy, and I'm there longer, I have a greater possibility of convincing you. Now, let's say, Eric, you still with me? Yep. Okay. Um, so, um, you know, I just saw something on the screen. So let, let's, let's say, for example, salesperson A and, and sales per, no, let, let's say, for example, a better, a better, um, a better example. You have an ad that, uh, for whatever product it is you sell and you write a, uh, you, you decide to write a short copy ad and then you write a long copy ad. Well, you have a person who's convinced with long copy and he's long copy and you have someone who is, can make up his mind with shorter copy. Well, if you write long copy ad, you're going to cover both the person who needs the short copy and the long copy. The short copy person can read the headline. If he likes the headline, he could go and click order now and he could send you a payment immediately, right? The long copy person also can keep reading, 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 reading. And then when he sat here, she said, I thought he could go and click on pay and send the order in. Now, if you just do short copy, that's good for the one audience, the short copy person. Uh, and then the long copy person is alienated. Now, the short copy person is not going to say, oh, wait a minute now. God, uh, this headline's amazing. Wow, I, this is exactly what I want. Oh, but wait a minute. There's much more copy to read. Oh, yeah, I can see I can click here right now. And order. But wait, there's far too much more copy to read. I'm not ordering the product. That's ridiculous. 
appeal to everybody. You, you know, give it to the guy who needs the, the, the maximum amount of convincing because you never know who's reading it. Yep. So this way with long copy, you could throw the kitchen sink at them. And, they, and, that, and that person who needs that will be convinced. The person who needs just a little bit, fine. Let them scroll. Let them click. Yeah. And like, when you're dealing like with the short that. attention spans of people today too, you know, you're thinking about a Facebook ad. This is something that I just – I heard about the other day that vertical video is becoming more popular than, than horizontal video in, in social environments because everyone's consuming content on their mobiles. And But it basically means that when you scroll through your news feed on Facebook – and you see an ad that is landscape, you scroll through that in a half a second. But to scroll through a vertical video takes an additional, you know, two seconds or one second, even in that time can make such a big difference. So when you're able to, you know, with, with Facebook, you always have to have the more button, right? You, you get a certain amount of content. And then when you have more, people click more. Um, but then it just takes up a good portion of their, of their news feed so that when they go back through it, it's more likely to catch their eye. That's kind of well, a cool idea about, yeah. I want to show you something about that. I'm glad you brought that. It's really interesting. I show this in a seminar, especially when I'm talking to folks who do print advertising. It's perfect. Can you see this page? Yep. Okay, good. So vertical versus horizontal. There's a natural eye flow. Okay, let's take what's what's the shape of most ads? I mean, many ads are square, right? Yep. But the eye flow typically starts it's slightly below center and slightly to the left of the center. It goes up and it makes these what are called lazy Z's all the way down the page, right? Now. What happens if you have a, a longer ad, right? I mean, the eye, the eye goes and takes longer time to travel across the entire ad. Hold on a second, my pen just died on me. <laughs> more technical there. problems. Yeah, more technical problems. But look at this. This is where this this is where this gets especially interesting. If you're advertising, let's say in a newspaper, and affiliates can make you know great um, uh, strides and uh, do remarkable things by supporting their uh, online advertising with print advertising. Okay. But let's say you have a newspaper page. This is where this really is um, um, more, more demonstrable. So you have a newspaper page and you have your square ads. Well, the same thing happens on a newspaper page. The eye starts about here and it goes up and it scans like this. So if you have a, a vertical ad, the eye is gonna spend more time scanning the entire newspaper page and it's gonna scan and hit Scan and hit, scan and hit, scan and hit versus here, scan, hit on to the next ad. Done, yeah. But it's, exactly, it's exactly what you say about videos. It's just going to take more time to look at that one particular ad. Yeah. Very interesting. So the one, one other thing I, I wanted to ch uh, chat about a little bit was uh, that you mentioned quite a bit in the acceleration modules is this idea of creativity. And people come in. And they, they, they come to advertising and they think they want to come up with the zaniest angles or the funniest the funniest ads necessarily. You really just have to look at uh, a Super Bowl commercial or any of these super, super high level ads that happen where, where they're just trying to associate a brand with maybe a, an idea. Uh, I think of the big failure of Pepsi this year with, with the Kendall Jenner ads where they tried to associate Pepsi with the power of rebellion or, or something like that, which was really, really poorly received. Uh, I got them a ton of headlines, but not not positive ones. So I'm curious, you know, you advocate for very direct, very benefits based. But when you do, you just shake your head when you see the the rest of the world or the high the the, the you know the highfalutin world of advertising really leveraging obscurity and random humor and p politics and things like this. What do you make of that? Well, um, there in the beginning, advertising was pure salesmanship. It was pure salesmanship. I mean, what we see as infomercials today is really a reflection of what advertising used to be online. If you want to see some great advertising, you know, go on YouTube and check out the old ads for whatever product. They're remarkably strong. They were selling. They were they they understood that advertising is nothing more than a salesperson in print or a salesperson broadcasted to the mass. That was pure selling. There came a time when it started to become more entertainment. TV was a big entertainment medium. So ads started to become more and more entertaining. There started to become more and more awards, not for advertising effectiveness, but for advertising creativity. And then so everyone said, wow, that's such a creative ad. Wow, that's amazing. Oh, that's so much fun. Oh, put dancers in there. Oh, we need singers, we need music, we need actors. 
and it became more of an entertainment medium. And then as such as this industry is, business owners, they know their product, they know their services, but they don't take time to study advertising. So they all start doing what everybody else is doing. You know, look, 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 look online and look in newspapers, look in magazines, look on TV. Everyone's copying basically what everyone else is doing. So few people go outside of that. It's very simple, really. It's not always easy to get great ad results. I mean, don't get me wrong, but it's very simple. Advertising selling, yeah, pure and simple. I, I feel like, uh, you know, I was looking for examples uh, of, of what's considered great advertising in today's day and age uh, when I was preparing for this. And a lot of them were, were these really high level, very interesting stories that tied brands to causes. But I came on like the Dollar Shave Club. The Dollar Shave Club for me, you've got a guy walking through a warehouse saying, hey, yeah. here's the problem with your razor situation. It's bullshit you're paying this much for razors. Uh, you know, he, he, I, we're in my factory right now. We produce, you know, at this cost. This is what you're going to get. And just really straight to camera, direct benefit kind of thing. And I think Dollar Shave Club is, got, is worth a billion dollars now or something ridiculous. Like it's a, just become this massive company just really leveraging this super direct, uh, you know. And that's in a world, I think it, it, it works especially well because it's in a world where the marketing has gone haywire. Where it's got, you know, you've got six different razor blades and you've got the one on the back. And uh, I remember seeing a Saturday, a Saturday Night Live commercial that was in the 70s, I think. And it was, a, it was a fake razor commercial and it said, this razor has three blades. And it was like a fake, it was a fake commercial that predicted and way undershot the amount of razors that we'd be actually putting into yeah. razors in order to sell. So to me, that was a really good example. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's nothing wrong with an ad being entertaining as long as you understand the focus. Entertaining doesn't mean doesn't necessarily mean song and dance. It just means you are interested, in my mind, as an advertising guy, it's interesting enough to keep watching or keep yeah. reading. Or to okay. click through. Or to click through. Yeah. I mean, if you want to see, if you want to, if you really want to see what truly great advertising is, now whether you like them or not. These are the ad, these are the commercials or the ads that follow the rules of effective advertising. They are the late night infomercials. Yeah. Whether you like the products or you hate the products, that is selling. That's what advertising is. And, 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 and you know, for, for, for crazy, pro some of, you know, the sham wow product, you know, um, the, the, the tape patches that can stop. Get, you know, flowing water from shooting out through the bottom of a boat. You ever see that guy saws yes. a boat in half and then puts this patch on the boat? I haven't seen that one. That's incredible. Those are amazing commercials. The vacuum cleaners that pick up ridiculous amounts of, of pet hair and then, and then another vacuum goes over it and it pulls out twice as much. I mean, these things are incredible. I just saw one the other day. I was, I was actually making something to eat at home and I had the TV on. And it was an infomercial for um, Shark Vacuum Cleaner. And I was saying to myself, that is advertising. I mean, boom, boom, boom. Not just benefit, but demonstration after demonstration, interweaved with testimonials, social proof, more demonstration. I mean, science, numbers. They, you know, two vacuum cleaners going over. The, they, they created a big template out of cardboard, put the template down on clean carpet, sprinkled sand in the middle of the template, just a cutout. Lifted the templates up, two different ones. One's the shark, one's another brand. They go over it the like, exact same number of times. They take the amount out of the canisters that each vacuum sucked up. They pour it into funnels that are with graduated, you know, lines. And one is up to, you know, from here to here. The one on the shark is way up top. That's strong, powerful advertising. That's that's advertising pure and simple, whether you like it or not. And the visual elements are, are so strong as well. This was, this was something else I wanted to get into here. I, um, I remember reading, I'm a big fan of Scott Adams. And Scott Adams is the creator of Dilbert, which is the, the comic about workplace follies. And he almost, I think almost three years ago now, basically right when Donald Trump announced that he would run, uh, Scott Adams was like, that guy's going to win. And everyone thought he was crazy and everyone uh you know everyone you know just said how ridiculous of an idea that was and and the, at that point the democrats were begging the republicans to run trump so that they could crush them crush him and and what what scott i i listened to a joe rogan podcast with scott adams and he he really one of the things he pinpointed for trump's success 
was his ability to speak in very straightforward, uh, if sometimes fragmented, uh, very visual language. So, you know, hearkening to the wall all the time. He's not talking about, uh, he's not talking about abstract concepts of, of, uh, of, you know, illegal aliens coming into the country thing. He's talking about a wall, a physical wall that you can see and that you can think. And every time he says it, you get a visual image of a wall. And he, he's done this with a number of other things. You listen to almost any time he talks, he's using really strong visual imagery in what he says. Um, and I assume that's obviously got to be a very powerful tactic for copywriting as well. Yeah, it's, it's very true. I mean, uh, you know, people are split. You know, you have visuals, auditory, people who um, more uh, are influenced and their, their, their style of communication is um, auditory. And then you have those that are kinesthetic, which is feelings or emotion. Yep. And um, visuals, one of the big ones. I'm very visual myself as well. All your and headlines for our courses are very visual. Very, 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 very visual. Yeah. And visual people tend to talk very quickly. You know, they talk in, with colorful language. Um, they have a, a, a specific representational language, representational style that where they use um, uh, things like, oh, I see things very clearly. Um, uh, that's a little, that idea is a little fuzzy, you know. NLP talks a lot about this representational systems or internal representations or these are predicates that people use to describe the world around them. So an auditory would say something like that doesn't really sound right to me or that rings true. Um, but um, when it comes to advertising, appealing to the greatest number of people with the with the representational style of language that uh, that connects to them. Uh, would be a wise thing to do. I mean, the majority of people are not kinesthetics. Um, so you don't, you don't want to make it all about feelings and emotions. So I think with Trump, I think it's a few things though. I think with him, I think um, it's an audience that was primed for that message. Um, you know, the country in the United States is pretty much divided between liberals and conservatives. I think, um, um, you know, some say you have eight years of one administration, then you have eight years of another administration. Um, of, of, you know, you have late years liberal, eight years conservative. Because um, they swing, because people get fed up with the one and then they become ready yeah, for the other. Exactly. So I, exactly. So I think that's, so I think that's part of, it. I think the audience was primed for his message. Secondly, he speaks in a way that advertising should be written. He speaks in a very simple fashion. It's, it's not a professor going, the guy is a multi-billionaire contractor, real estate developer. Okay. Um, he speaks to contractors. He speaks to um, those in the fields that ultimately end up creating skyscrapers and, and incredible properties and golf courses and whatnot. That's the way he speaks, which is perfectly primed to speak to the average person. And that's how advertising should be written. Uh, even if you write to a to doctors, you don't want to speak um, and you still want to speak in language that is incredibly clear. You're not going to talk to them in second grade terms. Of course, you're going to use their terminology, obviously. Uh, but you always want to keep the message simple. He keeps the message simple. You want to make it visual. Why? It's the same idea with selling. If I, Eric, remember the examples we just talked about? Will your family die in the night? Um, the um, um, protecting yourself on the street against against attack. Um um, having enough money to be able to feed your kids and not have their poor stomachs become distended because they're not having enough nutrition. I mean, visual language is something that allows you to cause somebody to demonstrate, and this is very powerful, to demonstrate your product or service in their heads yes. before they take the money out to buy the product. So if you could get someone to imagine the successful purchase and use and imagine satisfaction and happiness with the product before they buy it. Well, that's that's half of the sale right there. If they can't imagine, if you can't imagine yourself, if I'm selling you this phone and you can't imagine yourself using this phone, you can't even imagine it. You're never gonna you're never gonna give me the money to buy it. Yeah. So if I could use visual language and create movies in your head, or what I call in seminars internal representations in your head. And I could install these, this movie in your head and you go through and you say, yeah, I, I could see myself doing that. Yeah, I like that. And you know, when, and Eric, when you have this phone in your hand and you have a command center that's going to do 
350% more things that you could do now. And I, and I show you each of the things. I show you the apps that this thing is going to be able to run for you and how it's going to do much faster, much easier, much quicker, or for whatever product it may be. Then you're primed to buy at that point. So it's uh, so back to your, your Trump question. It's, it's, it's a market that's ready yeah. for a different yeah. message. It's visual language so they could see what it is that he's talking about. Not just, like you said, not just policy concepts and wonkery, but actual physical things. And it's a simple message that is also, Eric, repeated over and over and over again. Yeah. You don't want to, you don't want to, if you know, a lot of people run one ad or they run an, an ad for um, a certain amount, a short period of time. They say, ah, it's, that, it's not, the, the people don't want the product. That's not Saturated or something, yeah. Yeah, and you got to repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. Your audience will grow and grow and grow a little bit more each time with particularly talking about print advertising where people are reading the same publication each time. A little different for online, but still repetition is very important. That's, I think that's that's part of what the, the success is with. Uh, yeah, with, I, th I think, you know, he had that great, that sort of silent majority, I think. And he probably had, rep he had Republicans who were sort of fed up with uh, the, the nature of politics as usual. But he, I bet he had a lot of d Democrats who might have traditionally voted Democrat were just excited that someone was coming in with this non-political kind of talk. And I, I, I think I think there's probably a lesson to be learned in there about about thinking about the product that you're promoting as as a, as a real alternative or as as something that that kind of like blows up the field. Uh, you know, whenever possible, that's a great advantage to have. And I think it's probably his biggest advantage is that people were so fed up with with politics as usual that that he capitalized on both sides of the aisle by just talking straight. Well, you know about exactly. I mean, you made a good point. You know about the USP, your unique selling proposition. He's different. I'm not a politician. I'm not beholden to special interests. Yeah. You know, I don't have to do what these guys say because I don't need their money. You know, I'm working for you. That's the difference. That was his USP. Yeah. He's a businessman. You know, I know money. I know how to make money. And what's the social proof? He's a multi-billionaire, yeah. right? So. And then, and then putting it into your head, you're going to get so tired of winning. You're going to be sick of winning. <laughs> you know, like all, all these, all these things. He's putting these, these sort of thoughts right. into people's heads about, about how much, uh, how well it's going to go. It's, exactly. Uh, the message it, is different. He stood out, right? He stood out. I mean, why do I wear the white lab coat? Every other speaker on the planet gets up there in a coat and tie, yeah. majority of them, okay? Um, how do you stand out? You can stand out with your message. You can stand out visually. You can stand out with the content of what you say, not just the framework of, you know, um, the, the framework of what you say, the, um, the, the overarching theme of what you say. Yeah. Um, so I, for me, an advertising guy, I'm trying to practice what I preach. Nice. Okay, last question here. This is one that this is the, the whole point of it for me that I wanted to get it to. You have a you have two young children. You have two boys. You said, yes. I, I have a three year old daughter um, and a wife, of course. And I, I'm I'm interested in your your powers of persuasion and your yeah. your your precision with language and your benefit. Do you does does it apply to your to your personal life? Are you able to you know when whenever I'm, you're dealing with a young child, for instance, you're you're trying to get them to do what you want them to do. And you don't want, there's gotta be, there's a lot of technique in exactly how to do that. There's reverse psychology sometimes that works. There's a positive reinforcement. There's timeouts. There's things like, I'm wondering as a parent, do you find yourself using your techniques of communication effectively to, to get outcomes that you want? Uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> I do actually. Um, it's, it's interesting. I was asked this question during an interview just in, in Berlin and, um, yeah, you know, a lot of time it's, it's, it has gotten to the point where I'm not really conscious that I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. But when after I was asked that question, now I'm actually thinking about it more. Um, and it boils down to with the exact same things that when you're structuring an ad, you would you would um, adhere to. Number one, you know, AIDA, right? Get their attention first with the kids. Get their attention first. Yeah. And um, I'm saying, this is something really funny. I don't think I've ever said this to anybody before, but this is really something really interesting. So when I was in corporate meetings and sometimes had to go into somebody's office and you had um, two or three or four people all talking, I know it was, could be a whole meeting room of people. And I needed to get them to listen to me immediately. The second I walked in the room, it's so, it's so ridiculous, but it, wor it worked every time. Let me see if I could give you a demonstration of it here. 
I walked into the conference room, right? Whole table of people, you know, there's someone presenting on a board and everything. And I, I, but I needed an answer right away. And this is how I did it. And I got their attention like that. So I walked into the conference room. I didn't say one word. I just, <laughs> all I needed to do, <laughs> so, so ridiculous, but all I needed to do, th them to do was stop and listen to me so I could ask one of the people, one of the people in the room, the question. So I walked in the room like this, I opened the door and I just held up money. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say one word. They looked and everyone just shut up immediately. As wow. simple as that. Walk into a room and hold up money. The almighty dollar. Almighty dollar. Everyone, the person presenting, stopped. The main speaker, stopped. People who weren't even facing me, they all turned around because everyone else on their side stopped and looked. And as soon as I got their attention, I put the money away. I said, yeah, hey, John, do you know what time that meeting is? If I, or what time that meeting is? <laughs> <laughs> but I walked out. I never gave any explanation about the money, but that worked. So number one, get attention. Yeah. So I do, sim I do similar things with the kids, not, not money. Normally it's a toy. Yeah. But uh, with them, um, attention um, and, and interest them. Um, you know, um, because I know what their interests are, yep. um, you know, desire. So I'll build it up by asking questions, basically. Um, and, and then and then have them take whatever particular action I want. But basically, it's it's attention with kids, attention, benefit, super benefit and super simple language. Yeah. You know, my my son, if I want him to uh, to go to bed at a certain time, you know, um, and if they're going crazy, I might hold up. I might hold up some toy and they'll stop. And I'll say, hey, Chase, say, Chase, would you like to go swimming tomorrow for, for two hours and then go to the playground? And I've got a full attention right there. Great. Then all you need to do is first go upstairs, take off your clothes and get in the shower. Right. You know, I mean, so I'll just give them a step by yep. step by step, you know, break it down to the simple. And that's the same thing with your audience here. You know, um, step one. Read the, you know, read these, uh, read the information close. Step two, click on this link. Step three, breaking it down to the simplest, simplest. You don't want to lose them anywhere. Yep. If you've gotten somebody all the way from your headline and now you have them at your response device or you're at the portion of your, 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 your web page, your landing page or whatever type of uh, medium you're using. And now this is where you have to get them to take action. So they've read all the way down to this one point. You don't want to lose in there. So you got to make it as simple as possible. And the easiest way to do it is step one, step two, yeah. step three. Well, and tell them yeah, exactly Drew, what you want them to do. Yeah, exactly. I mean, but Drew, they know it's a link. They know they have to click on a link that says order now. Yeah, but see, advertising is sales and sales isn't about assuming that they know what, the, what they're going to do. It's about taking them by the hand and leading them like a child, respectfully, of course, you know, yeah. step by step by step. That, that's all you don't, you don't assume anything about what they know, what they don't know. Assume they don't know anything. Yeah. But don't assume they know anything. Give it to them. Make it easy. No one's going to complain that something is too easy for them. In fact, I like to have the business philosophies make ordering from you ridiculously easy. Make it like insane it's like it couldn't be any possibly easier you're sticking it in my face i know exactly what to do yeah. when to do what to do where to do it you know what i mean so that that's that's basically it remove all possible obstacles and like i say in a seminar your job is not to be a puzzle master as an advertiser yeah tell them exactly specifically straight to the point i think you might have a you might have a parenting book in you sure <laughs> <laughs> Cash for tizing for kids. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, we, my wife and I have some days that we, we don't we don't we don't think we have too much to teach on we, that stuff. We all do. What I I always find aligning interests makes a lot of sense. Like you want this, right? We know we both want this. Well, if you want this, you got to do this, this, and this because that's really how we how we come together. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly. nice. Cool. Exactly. Well, thank you so much. I want to yeah, thank you for coming by today. We've almost done an hour here. We flew by. Um, but I wanted to, if people want to get in touch, you know, obviously we're, we want people to take the acceleration modules. Uh, they're a really exciting opportunity to be sort of have a, a direct sort of three part lesson with you on, on some great things. But if people want to get in touch, they want to learn more about, about copywriting, you know, more, more about you. What do you suggest? Yeah. Well, um, well, specifically want to learn more about me. What I teach, just go to my website, drew or 
email me, drew at DrewEricWhitman.com. Um, as far as learning more, re read, you know, so much of the great stuff is the stuff written by the masters. Read the John Capel's books, Tested Advertising Methods, Making Ads Pay. You know, read the David Ogilvy work. Read Claude Hopkins, Scientific Advertising, My Life and Hour. Read the, don't, and I'm glad you asked the question. Nobody should ever ask, what should I do now to make my advertising better until they've read the classic books on advertising. Read Capel's, read Hopkins, read Ogilvy, read Eugene Schwartz. And there's so much more out there. But in, don't, don't worry about getting tricky. Don't worry, worry about sneaky black hat kind of stuff. Don't worry about subliminals. Learn the foundation, the classic stuff where the real sales takes place. The foundational teaching that, have, that has sold trillions of dollars worth of goods and products. Yep. Go, back to the, go back to the masters. Learn that stuff first. After you've read all that stuff, if you have questions from that point, that's great. It's like, you know, don't, don't ask how to do the, the headstand on the bicycle until you put the training wheels on or yeah. at least learn how to balance. And practiced a lot. And practice a lot because it is. It's something you got to do in order to. You can't. You can't just learn it through, through hearing about it. Even even if you do read all these books, you got to do it. You got to. You got to get out there. Uh, I yeah. think co uh, copying ads is is something that I hear a lot of people talk about. Literally, like you write you write out what another ad says, and then and you know you, you just start by writing it out so you feel the way it flows, uh, and then and then try to apply it to, to one of your own products. And Eric, I said that in, in one of the modules uh, about in the body copy module, that's one of the best ways get some of the hard, most hard hitting ads they've come from other people's brains. OK, you're probably not used to structuring words that way. So this is one way to get used to structuring words and getting your brain to think similarly, a similar tempo, similar phraseology, you know, similar um, connecting words from one paragraph to the next. It's as simple as that is. Take a hard thing, open up um, Breakthrough Advertising by Eugene Schwartz. Great, great book with some old hard hitting ads, okay? Or Google it, you can see some of them online. And print it out and just by hand. I'll give you the one paragraph a night by hand. Just yep. write, just copy it. Don't type it, don't use your computer. Just pick up a pen and paper and by hand, just write the words until you get a feeling of the flow. It's gonna be very unusual for most people to write that way. That's not your brain that, that originally wrote those words. So just do it, get, get a sense of how it feels and eventually you'll become more and more comfortable and you'll start writing more and more like that. That's that's just how you have to do it. And it can have a halo effect on your entire enterprise. If Even if you are just focusing on, on you know, affiliate marketing, you know, whether it's e-commerce, whether it's Facebook, you know, yep. you, you can have a massive halo effect by improving the focus of your copy across everything you do, I think. Absolutely. Absolutely. It can really impact everything in your life, really. I mean, it's your communications, right? I mean, what are we without our communication? Exactly. You can improve your communications in one area. Most likely, it's going to have a corresponding positive uh, effect on, on the other uh, areas you relate to. I mean, returning products in a store, you'll be more effective. I mean, most ridiculous things. If you're a better communicator, I mean, life just becomes much easier in many ways. I agree fully. Well, and for anyone, I'll tell you what, and, and finally, anyone who's interested in anything about affiliate marketing, I can't think of anybody uh, better than iStack to learn it from. I mean, you guys, uh, like I said, yeah, I think you guys have the golden touch when it comes to creating products. I mean, you find the best people. The stuff is the most uh, concise, direct, and it can really save you. I mean, what a shortcut. Instead of going through all the trial and error yourself, I mean, it's just like reading books, really. If you can read books by the masters, who have, go have spent decades and decades in the business, what an incredible, clever shortcut. You know, why go through all the trial and error yourself? I mean, you'll have your own trial and error, but why not amass first? Yeah. The learning is people who have spent decades in the business. Pick up all their goodies first, and then do your trial and error after you get, that's sort of like the training wheels, you know what I mean? Yeah. Then you can start, you know, then you can start doing all the tricks on your own. But uh, it's, it, iStacks, uh, I'll tell you what, I, I can't think of uh, a better organization that has put together um, such comprehensive information, but concise yeah. and dense. And that's the way I like to write, and that's why I wrote Cash Retizing. Nice. Well, it's a, obviously a good fit, and uh, I'm sure we'll be working together more in the future. So uh, until next time, thanks for coming on. Thank you very much, Eric. I really appreciate this opportunity. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.